you. I'm Cynthia Nicole, and we'd just like to thank Animal Community Talks for having us here today, and thank you all for coming. We're very excited to be here to talk with you about our book, Beyond Squeaky Toys, Innovative Ideas for Eliminating Problem Behaviors and Enriching the Lives of Dogs and Cats. And we're going to start our presentation today with a short video clip of a segment we did on AM Northwest. And this clip's just going to give you a sneak peek of what we're going to be talking about today. Welcome back to AM Northwest. Our first guest wanted everyone to know that a happy pet is a well-behaved pet. So we welcome the authors of Beyond Squeaky Toys, Squeaky Toys, Nicole Nicasio Hiskey and Cynthia Mitchell. Good to have you both with us. I love your book, Thank filled you. with great tips and things that we, we using things that we have around our house. Because mm -hmm. the biggest thing is the dogs get into trouble when they're not entertained or they're not exercised. Yes, and that's we, very true. you know, I buy I buy toys, and then they're destroyed in a matter of minutes, mm -hmm. and then the dog is bored. Right. Yes. I think the most important thing that we wanted to get across here is that, you know, it's really important to stimulate your dog, all aspects of your dog, mentally, physically, and socially, and and adding variety to their to their environment. So you know, you can have like you were talking earlier about having a backyard full of toys. Right. But he doesn't want to play with the toys. Right. So variety is important. Maybe you mix it up a little bit. Take some of those toys out. Keep them away for a while. You know, let oh. him get in, engaged in the ones that he likes. Just make sure that they're always novel, that they don't get bored with them yeah, after Okay, a while. so change it up. All yes. right. And you two have a background working in zoos where you have to work with these big animals and keep them busy all day long. Yeah. Is that where you learn some of yeah, that? Yeah, Cynthia and my, um, our, our work experience is mostly work with exotic animals. So when we transitioned and kind of took in pets and started doing behavioral counseling for pet owners, um, we quickly realized that training is huge. People are really into clicker training and training. Right but enrichment was missing. Mm -hmm. And that is a huge part. It's the other half of a well-behaved pet. And what do you mean by enrichment? And so basically environmental enrichment is anything that a pet or an animal can find physically, socially, or mentally engaging okay. or stimulating. And so the great thing about our book is that we take things that you already have in your home, so it doesn't cost a lot of money. It can be very easy to do, and you can do it with your family. All right, let's well. start one. There's one that you use with tennis balls. Yeah, How many so you that? Well, the first thing we brought is a, just a muffin tin and some balls. And what we've done is we've actually taken just a regular tennis ball and cut a slit into it. There's treats and then some nori seaweed in here. Nori and seaweed, so okay. this can actually be a healthy snack. But then on top of that, we've put treats inside the muffin tin and covered the treats up with balls. So Chewy is going to work at getting his food now. Instead of feeding your dog out of a dog food bowl, which some dogs eat very quickly, and cats too. This oh. book is for cats. Mm -hmm. It can cause digestive issues and other health problems that you may even have to visit your vet for. So by slowing down the food feeding process and adding challenge to it, this can make um, feeding time a lot more exciting and challenging for the animal. Oh, that is great. So he removes the ball, he gets the treat, treat. but then also within the balls, there's more treats to find. And that, that sounds like a great way to feed your dog. Dog, but mm -hmm. keep them, you know, like you said, my dog just wilts it down in seconds. Yeah. Right, right. Okay, love and that, that one. And um, then you have one called a muffin. Uh, so the, ex the other one we got oh, is. the tennis ball. Yeah, you, yeah, okay. The tennis ball and the muffin tin, we kind of paired that one up. The okay. other one that Chewy actually finds very challenging is putting a few treats. Can you hold him for just a second? Just you could put even your dog's meal under a small blanket, and uh -huh. the bigger the blanket, obviously the harder the challenge. Put some treats under the blanket and then have your dog or your cat, you could put toys under there. Um, under the blanket, they have to work to get the, the treats or the food out. Mm -hmm. This is also helpful for animals that have separation anxiety. You can do a bunch of stuff like this around the house before you leave say, to go yeah, to work. I was going to say, yeah, can you set out various that would make a lot of Absolutely. sense. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, that's hysterical. So. Okay, kibble in a bottle. Yes, that's the next one. So this is basically just, you can take any water bottle uh -huh. or soda bottle, take the labeling off and make sure you cut the little plastic ring off that holds the cap sure, on. that makes sense. Fill it with treats or I suggest even filling it with their diet. Now one of Nicole and our mottos is throw away the food bowl 
and let your dog really work for its food. So Great idea. you put some kibble in a bottle and let him just go at it. And he'll knock it around and the kibble will spill out randomly. You see, science has told us Look that, at that. Yeah, that animals would rather work for their food they get, than get it handed to them. So why not you know, extend out the feeding period, let them work for it. It's just more reinforcing when they have to really work hard to get that kibble out. Boy, if you had an overweight dog, this would be a great yeah. way to... I need to do that to myself, actually. And, you know, they <laughs> okay. get pretty good at it after a while. So another way that you can make it a little more difficult once, you know, it doesn't take them too long to get the kibble out is to get a larger pot bottle and put uh, paper towels inside. Uh -huh. And the paper towels just make it more difficult for the kibble to spill out. So Great. just to kind of add on to that one. Now you have something, uh, you have stuffed frozen bone marrow. Yeah, this is a great now this one. this is interesting. So this actually was thought up by one of my clients at Doggy Daycare. She has, Martha has a dog named Momo who is a Malmute and he well, that's just... that's a big dog. Yeah, and he thinks he's starving all the time. Right. You know, so she has a hard time because she'll feed him his kibble and he'll woof it down in like three seconds. Right. And then he's wanting more and you know, so she, what she did was she got one of these marrow bones, you can get them at the feed store, and packed it with wet food and some kibble, packed it real tight and put it in the freezer for like three or four hours. Okay. And then when she offers this to her dog, Chewy, let's try this one. It takes Momo like 45 minutes to get all of the food out of that bone. And he'll lay down, he'll work on it, lick it out. And what happens is when he's done, he's very content and satisfied. Oh, yeah. So now what, with something like this, would you make sure this stays outside or can it I mean, would it ruin a carpet? Well, it, it, it would probably. It depends. Mm -hmm. You know, some of these some of these are definitely more for outdoors, Outdoor. and if you don't like a lot of noise, some of them like this can get a little noisy for mm -hmm. some people. Mm -hmm. But this is great if you have like if your dog's in a in a crate mm -hmm. or in the garage or on hardwood floors, it would be really Good easy idea. to. Mm -hmm. What about uh, you said you have some tips for cats? Can you quickly tell, tell us yeah, about a couple of those? Yeah, a lot of the we have 108 enrichment items listed in the book. They're divided into six different types of enrichment categories, mm -hmm. and of those 108 items. Most of them are for dogs and cats. Mm -hmm. Some are just specifically for cats and some are just for dogs. But mm -hmm. we have it very easily labeled in there. There's dog, cat, and whether the enrichment items mm -hmm. should be supervised. Because some of them are supervised. Oh, right. They might cause a safety yeah. issue. Okay. So. Again, it's called Beyond Squeaky Toys. Thank you both very much. Thank this you was for very entertaining us. and very informative. So Beyond Squeaky Toys is a book about environmental enrichment. And today you're going to learn what enrichment is, how it works, and why it's so important for the health and well-being of our pets. Enrichment had its origins in the zoo and aquarium field with exotic animals, but it's now making the transition into the companion pet field, which is very, very exciting. Nicole and I um, have been working with both exotic and domestic animals for decades. I started my career in 1983 as a staff biologist at the Point Defiant Zoo and Aquarium in Tacoma. And there I worked with a variety of land mammals, birds, and marine mammals. Everything from pigs and penguins to dolphins and walruses. And then um, I, in 1991, I moved to Chicago, Illinois, and took a position at the Shedd Aquarium as a marine mammal trainer. And there I was responsible for training beluga whales and white-sided dolphins for husbandry behaviors and um, demonstrations. I moved back to the Pacific Northwest, which is my home, in 1992 and took a job at the Oregon Coast Aquarium when they first opened. I was hired as the senior mammologist and I was responsible for developing training and enrichment programs for seals, sea lions, and otters. And it was there that I actually got the great opportunity to work with Keiko the killer whale who starred in the movie Free Willy. It was a real awesome experience, one of the highlights of my career. Um, then in 1999, I decided that I was going to try my hand at becoming an entrepreneur, and so I opened Dog on Fun Doggy Daycare Center in Tualatin. And we were one of the first dog daycares to open in the Portland metro area. So now I offer my years of experience in enrichment and training to dogs and their owners. Nicole and I met in 1993 while working at the Oregon Coast Aquarium. Yes, I was fortunate enough to um, get an internship there right out of college, and um, Cynthia kind of took me under her wing and mentored me, and I worked there for five years working um, with all the same animals, sea lions and harbor seals and sea otters and um, Keiko when he was there. And then after that, I actually took a position up at the Alaska Sea Life Center in Seward, Alaska, where I worked with awesome stellar sea lions and harbor seals for a couple years. 
And then I came back, I decided Alaska it was too cold after about three and a half mm -hmm. years. So I came back to Oregon where I'm from and um, got a job at the Portland or the Oregon Zoo. And I've been there ever since. So I've worked there for about 14 years and I am the senior keeper of the marine life area. So I take care of sea otters. We used to have stellar sea lions, but now we have harbor seals. But I also get to work with the tigers, the leopards, the sun bears, and the polar bears. So. And Cynthia and I actually wrote this book a few years ago, and so we're doing this kind of as well. To keep getting the word out there. <laughs> because our book, Beyond Squeaky Toys, is really a unique book. In fact, it's the first of its kind that discusses the topic of environmental enrichment for pets. We wrote this book for pet owners everywhere because we found that when we were working with pet owners that we were suggesting more and more enrichment ideas to help them deal with the behavioral problems that they were experiencing with their pets. And our clients were just thrilled at the results they were getting and not only that but you know how easy and inexpensive it was. And so it didn't take us long to realize that we needed to make environmental enrichment just as commonplace as positive training is, positive reinforcement training is with, with dogs and with cats too, because both are essential to a well-behaved pet. And so that's what made us decide we were going to write this book. And when we started writing the book, we knew it had to be easy to read and understand so that any pet owner could pick it up and start an enrichment program of their own. We also knew it had to give pet owners easy, inexpensive, and effective solutions for dealing with these problem behaviors that they're experiencing. But most importantly, they had to work. And so we took our background in enrichment with exotics and our experience working with dogs and cats and came up with Beyond Squeaky Toys. You know, one of the main reasons why we wanted to write this book is because when we were working with pet owners, we found that the vast majority of the behavioral problems they were experiencing had to do with the fact that their pets were just bored. And if you think about it, most dogs and cats spend eight to 10 hours a day home alone with nothing to do, waiting for their people to come home and take them for the walk and play and have a good time. And you know, we all know that a bored pet is a naughty pet. I mean, pets that are bored, they tend to indulge in behaviors that we as pet owners perceive as, you know, destructive or problem behaviors. But for the dog or cat, it's just something fun to pass the time away. And they'd come up with some pretty, pretty interesting things, but <laughs> not really conducive to, you know, strengthening the pet owner bond. And it's in fact one of the reasons why many pets are relinquished to shelters. And there are actually six to eight million dogs and cats that are, that enter shelters every year. And of that, 2.7 million of them are euthanized. And this is a really a sad but true fact. And one of the reasons why Nicole and I felt so strongly about writing this book, because we wanted to give pet owners simple, easy, easy solutions for dealing with these problem behaviors. And we believe that in doing so, we could strengthen that pet owner bond and most importantly, keep pets in forever homes. And in our book, Beyond Squeaky Toys, we have a section that is dedicated to this issue. We call it enrichment prescriptions. And what we've done is we've identified the six most common behavioral problems that people experience with their dogs and cats. There's barking, separation anxiety, inappropriate elimination, chewing, clawing and scratching, and digging. And then what we've done is showed you how you can use enrichment that you can find right in the book to help modify or eliminate many of these problems, all of these problem behaviors. So what is environmental enrichment? You heard a little bit about what it is in our video that we did in AM Northwest, but it's any artificial or natural, that's the great thing, you have two options, and it's any item that can stimulate an animal physically, socially, or mentally. So there's a huge window of opportunity out there. And it's beneficial for any animal, farm animals, companion animals, shelter animals, domesticated pets. Um, and so what we did is we put two slides together here and you can see the acrylic box on the left. There's basically three rats living in an empty box. It has some substrate in it, which in itself is enriching. And there are conspecifics living together. But other than that, there's really not a whole lot going on. 
So with the addition of enrichment in an environment, you can really expand an animal's opportunities for challenge and control over their environment and all kinds of fun stuff. So in the right box, you'll notice that there are some rats uh, getting together and communicating or doing whatever <laughs> the rats do together. There's some climbing, one's rolling, they have tubes to climb through. They have opportunities to segregate or isolate themselves maybe in a dark box or climb on something, roll something around. So that's basically what the zoo and aquarium industry did 20, 30 years ago is started introducing these tools into the environment because people coming to zoos and aquariums wanted to see the animals moving and doing things, not just sitting there and sleeping all day or pacing. So that's exactly what we're hoping to introduce to the pet industry is these opportunities for pets to become engaged with things so that you're giving them something to do and using, they're eliciting their natural behaviors so that they're not just sitting around becoming bored and maybe doing something destructive. And so why is enrichment important? Well, you guys work with animals. I think you've probably connected the dots at this point. Helps to lower destructive behavior. Super important because if you have a family that has a that comes home every night and their dog's destroying their house or their cat's clawing the drapes, there's a huge chance that that cat may end up in a shelter, which is the last place we want these pets to end up. And in addition, these animals, and this is one of the things that always kind of surprised me going into people's homes that were hiring me, is people need to understand that these cats and dogs and these companion animals, they need to do certain things like scratch and bark. These are all natural behaviors, just like you and I talking to one another. So we have to figure out a positive way for them to do those without destroying property or getting into trouble and doing naughty things that people don't like. So, and we feel very strongly that it's just as important as training your animal, giving them high quality health care, high quality food, shelter and water. Enrichment, it should be lumped in with all of those other categories because it is a huge part of their, their mental um, psyche, basically. So if you think back, you know, 50 years ago, even 100 years ago, this might be, have been a very common thing that you would have seen going to a zoo. And a lot of zoos, because they're still raising money and trying to change these exhibits, you may even see this occasionally if you go to a different country or a, a zoo or an aquarium that doesn't have a lot of money in some parts of the world. And over the years, we've really learned a lot as exotic animal caretakers that these animals need things to do. They need enrichment, they need stimulation in their lives. And that means even for the octopus you take care of. Octopus are super smart animals. They are problem solvers. They can figure out puzzles. So to give them and offer them things like that is very important. Or to give a sea otter a frozen ice treat that has food frozen inside so that they actually have to utilize one of their natural skills of banging and cracking open food items to get it the meat inside. Or to offer a, we can't offer them a real giraffe in a zoo. <laughs> People would not want to see that. But we can have volunteers and staff create objects that look like prey animals. You can put meat inside. You can actually even put giraffe feces on it, make it smell like a giraffe by making it hang in the giraffe barn for a while, offering it to the tiger. And now the tiger has an opportunity to stalk and pounce and tear apart and process prey, which is super important instead of just getting the meat maybe on the floor. Or offering a polar bear a bunch of apples. Yes, polar bears do like apples. It's kind of strange, but they do. Um, inside of a frozen ice block so that they can chip away at that and work at it. So these are all examples of how zoos and aquariums have come a huge way in the last few decades, really. And if you think about 50 to 100 years ago where our pets were, a lot of pets had jobs. They weren't just hanging out on the couch all day. <laughs> they were out on the farms. The cats were catching mice and rats. They were exhausted at the end of the day. They had jobs. They needed to go to that wood pile and sniff something out. They would haul equipment around. They'd herd ant, you know, livestock. Oh, some of them would get free milk, apparently. <laughs> um, and I even remember hearing stories, even from my, my mom grew up, the dogs would even walk down to the bus stop and pick the kids up and bring them home on that dirt path on the way home. So they had jobs. They, they were tired at the end of the day. 
and nowadays it's very different. Mm -hmm. Our pets are doing, a, you know, not a lot of the same things these days. Um, we hire dog walkers, which is great. Your dog's getting exercise, but a lot of times they're going out with many other pets, which is fun too because it's a social opportunity. They're sitting around, hanging out, looking out the windows. Um, you can usually always tell those houses that have dogs in the front windows because the blinds are always kind of torn apart. <laughs> <laughs> and you can hear them barking inside. Some of them are left in crates for long periods of time or maybe even, you know, we dress our pets up a lot now in costumes and treat them like children. So they've really, they're, they're, they, fill, they fill very different niches now. And really, like Cynthia said in the video, science shows us that enrichment is super important for um, an, a living being's mental capacity. It helps it to decrease anxiety. And we know what anxiety does. It gives you stress. It can make you sick. So anxiety is something we don't want in ourselves or in our pets. It helps reduce stress. If an animal is busy working at something, like a puzzle feeder, instead of being stressed out about where their owner is, that's really what we want. It slows aging. If you have a healthy, happy pet, hopefully they'll live longer if they're getting a good diet and good medical care, too. Um, it increases curiosity. Curiosity is important. You want your animals to be curious and test that curiosity so that they can be confident animals and they can have hopefully less, uh, not have as much fear issues. We have a lot of dogs with fear problems. It improves problem solving. That's really important too. And it encourages natural behaviors. Allowing our pets to do these natural behaviors is key because they need to be able to do what naturally comes to them. If I'm a cat, I want to scratch and I want to pounce. Just like I'm a person, I want to do certain things. So the goal of environmental enrichment then is to encourage our pets to interact with their environment and use their natural skills and abilities and their breed specific behaviors in positive ways. And so in order to do that, we need to offer our pets what Nicole and I call the four C's of enrichment, challenge, change, choice, and control. So the first one is challenge. And you know, it's important that we offer our, our, our pets a good challenge. They need a good challenge in their life. They need opportunities that encourage them to think and figure things out on their own. Enrichment that offers challenge really help, keeps your pet occupied for long periods of time, like those food feeders. And things like learning new behaviors or using a food feeder, they're not only stimulating mentally, but they're also physically exhausting. And that's what we want, a nice, tired pet that's had a great day of enrichment. <laughs> the next one is change. And really, the key to a successful enrichment program is variety. It doesn't take long for the pets, for our, our dogs and cats, to habituate to, envir to environmental enrichment. And we talked about on the video clip how you, know, you might have a room full of toys or a backyard full of stuff for them to do. And, you know, they might interact a little bit, but then pretty much they're laying on the couch or laying out in the grass and not doing anything. Well, if we rotate those toys in and out, um, maybe add something new to the environment every once in a while, rotating these things regularly will ensure their novelty and keep your pet interested for longer periods of time. Choice is the next one. And, you know, it's really important that we give our, op our pets the opportunity to make choices about their lives. And if you think about it, we do this with our, fam with our kids all the time. It's like, OK, Johnny, you can do A, B, or C. You get to decide which one, but these are your choices right here. Well, we should do the same thing with our pets. Give them several different enrichment opportunities, and let give them the time and space to let them figure out which one they want to interact with. And the last one is control. When we provide opportunities for our pets to control certain aspects of their life, what we're doing is we're teaching them to make positive, appropriate choices. That's what we want. We want them to make the, the good choice, not what we perceive as the destructive choice. And as a result, like, you, like Nicole said, you get an animal that's confident, creative, and an excellent problem solver. So every time you offer enrichment to your pet or you make an enrichment item, just ask yourself if it fulfills one or all of the four C's, challenge, change, choice, and control. In our book, Beyond Squeaky Toys, we have over 100 
different enrichment items that you can choose from. But what we've done for you is we've categorized them into six different, we separated them into six different categories of enrichment. And the first category of enrichment is social enrichment. And these are opportunities that give your dog or cat the opportunity to interact with different people, places, and desensitize them to different animals as well. And this is so important, especially for puppies. You really want to start young with social enrichment. And I can't even tell you how important it is you're going to eliminate the possibility of fear issues later in their life if you start young. And get them out in the world. Get them out there seeing the guy with the beard, or the woman holding the umbrella, or you know the different dogs walking down the street, downtown. And make sure that you always bring a big pocket full of their most valued treats that you can think of. You know, chicken, cheese, whatever. Because what you want to do is you want to associate that potentially scary, not sure thing with something really positive. So social, those are social enrichment ideas, and we have a bunch of them in the book. The next is cognitive enrichment. And this is providing opportunities for your pet to think and figure things out on their own. And a great example of that is training, positive uh, reinforcement training. Very important. And a lot of us do this. You know, we get a new dog, and the first thing we do is we put them in a, in a class, and we teach them the obedience, you know, sit down, stand behaviors. And then what happens is then we never go to a class again. <laughs> well, behavior is very much like working out. You know, you go to the gym three days a week, and you're working out, and you're getting some muscle, and you're losing a couple pounds, and you're feeling all good and lots of energy. But when you stop working out, what happens? You, you know, you get the saggy muscles and a couple pounds around the middle, and you're feeling really lethargic. Well, that's the same thing that happens with training. If you don't do it regularly, behaviors break down. And the other thing, too, is you know, you don't want to have to go and take, nobody wants to do math all day long, really, you know? So the dogs don't want to have to go do the obedience behaviors all the time. So, so teach your dog some fun tricks. There's some great uh, um, sport uh, things you can get your dogs involved in, agility, fly ball, nose work is a great one. Mix it up, do some really fun things. It's really important. The next is physical environment enrichment. And this is enrichment that enhances your animal's living area. And a great example of that would be cat trees. Cat trees are pretty cool these days. In fact, a lot of them even look like trees. But they offer your, pet, your cat different levels to sit on. They have little cubbies so they can go in a little dark hole and get away if they want to. You can hang toys from them, spray scents on them, move them to different windows. Just such a great form of environment enrichment. And the next one is sensory enrichment. And this is enrichment that stimulates the five senses, taste, touch, sight, sound, and smell probably the least used of all the enrichment categories, but one very important one, because our dogs do have a heightened sense of smell, you know, taste with our cats, or you know, they, can scent, they can see really well. These are important things to stimulate with our pets. And we've got some really cool ideas in the book to you know, enhance their senses. And the next one is feeding enrichment, and this is the ways in which you present food to your dog or cat. And this is probably the most common. Everybody uses some form of enrichment. And like we said on the video, Nicole and I's motto is throw away those food bowls. Get rid of those food bowls and let your dog work for the food. Let your cat work for the food as well. And the cool thing that you can do is you can break their feedings up into four or five different feedings throughout the day. You know, take their allotment, divide it up into different four or five different feedings, use the de-enrichment devices. And like we said, it just it takes, it takes them longer to get food out of a Kong wobbler than it would to eat the same food out of a bowl, which takes about five seconds. And obviously, there could be some health problems if they eat too fast, which if you have a lab, that's usually the case. <laughs> And the next one is manipulative toy enrichment. And these are toys that your pets can manipulate, investigate, and explore. We've all been to the pet stores. There's aisles and aisles of pretty cool toys. I mean, they're coming up with some pretty cool stuff. And they're great, but they can be really expensive. 
And nobody wants to drop you know, 20, 30 bucks on a toy that your dog goes home and destroys in five minutes, right? So what we've done is in our manipulative toy category, we've given you some really cool ideas that, that you can make at home with things out of your recycle bin. You can uh, um, share toys with friends, a bunch of really cool ideas for toys. So the key is to stimulate all aspects of your pet, mentally, physically, and socially. And if you choose enrichment items from the different enrichment categories, you're going to do just that. Make it fun and exciting. And oh, this next, we have a couple examples of enrichment that you can find in our book. And this first example is of a feeding enrichment. And this is uh, we, what we call a busy box. This is Dozer, Nicole's dog. Your next client. Yes. <laughs> and basically what this is, is an empty cereal box. And we've put treats inside. And Dozer's never experienced this before, so this is a first for him. And he can't figure, he knows there's food in there, but he can't figure out how the heck to get it out. And so the first thing he did was he pounced on it and collapsed the box, which actually just makes it more difficult. And so then he's scratching at it and scratching, maybe that'll get it out of there. I mean, I know, and, and the cool thing about the dogs is they're going to work at this for a, a long time, trying to figure it out. How do I get that food mail? Maybe I'll just keep scratching it. That doesn't work, so now I'm going to resort to tearing it up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then he gets it out. And you know, another important thing to note, in our book, we have a whole section dedicated to safety. Safety is very important, our number one priority. So if you have a dog that eats everything, paper or whatever, this may not be the thing that you want to choose to do with your dog, but you can get you know, those heavy non-destructible balls and drills holes in it and put food in that, they'll probably won't be able to eat that. So, you know, use your common sense, watch your dog, know your dog, know what, you know, he does so that you can make sure that you give him the right enrichment. And we also suggest in our book too that anytime you offer new enrichment that you always want to make that supervised. Watch them to see how they interact with it before you leave them alone with it. The next one is um, a sensory enrichment idea. And this is just a TV and video. And this is actually Dozer again with um, Nicole's daughter, Allie. And they're both sitting and watching TV. And what's actually on TV is a cat doing enrichment too. She's trying <laughs> to get the paper out of the printer. But you can see how into it Dozer is. I mean, Tell him, you, Nicole tells me. Yeah, I have to limit his TV time. He's really <laughs> pathetic, actually. He'll watch squirrels on YouTube forever. <laughs> but this is a great thing to do for, you know, if you have kids to, so that they can get involved and do some interactions with their dogs. Hang out with the dog, develop that bond between the kids and the dog, and watch TV together. How fun is that? They've got some great videos for cats, too. Okay. So earlier, Cynthia had mentioned that at the end of our book, near the end, we have this section called Enrichment Prescriptions. And that's where we felt we needed to kind of help guide people through some of those difficult behavior problems that you see um, with cats and dogs. And so we did some research, and we came up with the six most common, which we would mentioned earlier. And we decided, well, in our book, we definitely need to teach people about enrichment, but then how do you use enrichment with training to help fix these behavior problems? So in our presentation today, we just chose two, one for a dog and one for a cat. We're going to talk a little bit about um, how you can use enrichment to aid in modifying behavior. So the first one we're going to talk about is clawing and scratching. And first, we feel it's really important to understand why cats scratch and claw in the first place because sometimes cat owners don't even realize that their cats need to do that. So it's important to understand that it's a natural behavior for felines, all felines, even the tigers and the leopards I work with at the zoo. They've got to scratch stuff. It just naturally happens. And while they're scratching, they're doing a lot of important things. Um, they're stretching. You know, they're stretching all those arm and leg muscles, which is really important to help keep them limber and, and fit. But also, they're shedding that nail or that claw sheath so that they can continue to grow those nice, sharp little nails we like. Mm -hmm. um, 
Obviously, while they're doing all of that, they're leaving their scent, which is a huge part of their communication world. So that's important too. So all of those things are really important to not take away from the cat or the felines. So in our book, we talk about, well, what are some things you can do enrichment-wise along with training to make it more appropriate in the house so that your items don't get destroyed? And we actually did a segment on AM Northwest um, that's on our website that's free that you guys can watch if you want. It's about five minutes long, and it talks about cat scratching. Um, it's really important to understand what type of scratching a cat likes to do because some cats like to do the horizontal scratch, some like to do you know up and down on a wall, maybe some like to do around something like a plant. So offering many different options to a cat, and some households have more than one cat, so you want to have multiple options for cats so that they can experiment and figure out which ones are going to work best for their body and their, their personality. That's really important. So just because one a cat scratcher on the floor doesn't work, don't give up. There's other things that can work. I, right? have to, I would like to add, I have a cat at home and I noticed that when I, I adopted him and he's like 12 years old and I brought him in the house and he started scratching up the carpet. Carpet was lousy in that house, but he was scratching it up and I'm noticing it. So I went and I got a cat scratcher, the kind of the swirly ones. He wouldn't use it. He wouldn't use it. I sprayed stuff on it, wouldn't use it. I went and got one of the box ones that say on the floor. Oh my God, he loves that thing. And, and now I call it a station because every time he gets excited, he runs over to that little scratcher and he scratches and then he sits there. And sometimes I'll come home and he'll just be sitting on his little scratcher. So that's so important, and I, fig and I found that out myself because I'm I had to go through right. several of them to figure out. Mine's one of the horizontal scratchers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you do. You have to try different things until you find something that works best for you. And some of them have to be a certain size, or you know maybe hang a certain way on the wall. Um, so you should have different stations throughout the house, or even in your backyard. If there maybe you don't want them scratching on certain things in your backyard. So offer different stations with varied and diverse um, different items. And, you know, we even built one that we took on AM Northwest, and we went and got cedar plank shingles from, uh, like, Home Depot and put Velcro on it. And you could remove it and put different um, carpet samples or uh, cedar sh shingles or I can't remember, fabric, and we would just replace them every once in a while. Mm -hmm. So it would be different for the cat. Um, they should, obviously, like I mentioned, they should vary in size and changing out what substrate you try. So if one thing doesn't work, like rope doesn't work, try something else. Maybe they like fabric or something else like cardboard. The other important thing, which kind of ties into training, is if you attach bells to them and the cat is utilizing the scratching post, it's an audible signal for you hanging out in the house, my cat's using the appropriate thing. I should go reinforce that. So you want to follow it up with, reinforcing that behavior. So maybe you run a little treat or a little piece of tuna over to your cat so that they know this is not only a great place to scratch, but you're going to get little treats here every once in a while. So you want to reinforce that behavior as well. So bells are a great way to do that. And then digging. We get a lot of uh, complaints from dog owners, um, especially in the summertime when the weather's nice and dogs are out more. How do I get my dog to stop digging in my garden or in um, my backyard flower bed? So again, we have to understand digging is a natural thing, not for all dogs. I, I've been, my dogs don't tend to dig, but I've met some digging dogs that <laughs> should be in contest. So a couple, I mean, for those of you who have digging dogs, you know that a lot of times in the summertime when it's really hot, they're really trying to dig cooling holes and just try to, you know, you have those big fluffy Malamutes or Huskies or something, and they want to cool off. So they want to remove that couple first inches of soil to get to that cooler soil underneath, and of course that's going to cause a problem in a garden or a flower bed. Some dogs do bury toys. I have a friend of mine that just... Um, got recently a German Shepherd and they're learning that that dog likes to dig and bury toys and never goes to get them again, but <laughs> they will find them when they're gardening, so their Shepherd likes to bury toys. They do, 
oftentimes you'll see dogs after they go to the bathroom defecate or urinate. They'll start really shredding up the backyard. My dog likes to do that one. And, uh, you know, they, they're scent marking. I tell my nine-year-old daughter, he's just leaving messages for the rest of the neighborhood. It's important for him to do that. And it's just a natural behavior. That's another way that they communicate with each other. Obviously, some dogs, um, when we're talking about dogs that are maybe in, in heat, uh, males can smell females from a couple blocks away. They're going to dig to get out. And that's I think a common problem in a lot of different cities and parts of the world where dogs are kind of roaming around, they get out of yards, and you know they're, they're going and breeding with other dogs. Or to chase other animals. We've got a lot of squirrels in Portland. I know my dog's squirrel obsessed, so you know they might dig to get at a raccoon or a squirrel or a scent of something. Some dogs like to dig for fun. If you take dogs to the beach, a lot of times you'll see them digging in the sand. It's a great form of exercise, and you know, it burns a lot of energy, but they are digging pretty good-sized um, good holes. And then, of course, when they're defecating, a lot of times they'll, some of the cats especially will want to bury their feces. So how can you redirect digging behavior so that your pet owners are happily living with their digging uh, companions. Oh, we tell a lot of people, you know, you can set aside a certain area of the yard that is appropriate for digging. And maybe that's like a little corner of the backyard or on the side. You can even build a little berry or a dig pit like up in this upper right picture. You can bury toys and little treats in there and the dog will smell them. Maybe even the cat will smell them and they'll naturally want to dig there. You can even maybe use some scents in that area. And if they start digging in that area, that's an appropriate digging area that you've um, allowed them to dig in. So you want to reinforce that. You want to tell them they're being a good dog or a good cat and reinforce them with some treats. Um, for the dogs that are just trying to cool off, you can give them a little kitty pool or turn on the, even the hose or the sprinkler for them. We have some great ideas on how to make some ice treats in the book so that and other ways for them to cool off might uh, take away their digging. So obviously going to the beach is great fun for dogs, maybe not so fun for cats, but if they want to dig, let them dig up a storm at the beach. I know I let my dog do that. And sometimes you can even bring sand home and you can add it into your digging pit and that kind of brings home some nice natural smells as well. Um, for cats, a lot of owners get upset when they're gardening and they're coming across their cat's you know, feces in the gardening beds. So you can make an outdoor litter pan and change it out and get, encourage them to go to the bathroom there. If you see them going into the bathroom in that appropriate area, obviously reinforce them. So you probably figured out by now that really the key to good and successful enrichment program is variety. Changing things up, switching things around, keeping it new and exciting so your pets don't get bored. Because if they do get bored, they're not going to come and say, Mom, I'm bored. What they're going to do is go and tear up, you know, one of your new pair of designer shoes or chew up the leg on the couch. So the best way to keep your enrichment program varied is by rotating enrichment. And the way you can do that is using enrichment schedules. And am I working here? And what we've done in our book, Beyond Squeaky Toys, is given you a month's worth of enrichment schedules. These are so important because we are creatures of habit. I mean, we tend to do the same thing over and over. We don't even think about it. It just becomes mechanic, mechanical. But your dogs and cats, they know. I mean, if they could talk to you, they'd be going, OK, Mom, I've had that Kong with peanut butter five days in a row, and I'm ready for something new. And the best way to do that is with these schedules. Now, in our book, like I said, we have these all set up for you, ready to go. We've got the categories of enrichment, and we've picked an item from each of those categories for a cat or a dog. Now, this is just for one day, so it's pretty involved. And a lot of people are not going to be able to do six different things in a day for their dog or cat. And that's totally OK and understandable. But you can just modify it, maybe do two or three things a day. And then during the week, Monday through Friday, they get two or three enrichment items. During the weekend, they get several, four or five. And the, the other great thing about having these enrich enrichment schedules is that you can get the family involved in this. You can get a whiteboard and have your kids be in charge of the cat or dog enrichment. 
and you know, write Fluffy's name on the board, write the categories of enrichment, and then they can go through the book and look up and pick what items they want out of that category and write it down on the schedule. So you can have the whole week scheduled out. And the other thing you can do is get them involved in making the different items. So if you're going to have a stuffed toy on one day, then they have to have that stuffed toy all prepared for that day. And then they can give the toy to the dog. It's a great way to get the kids involved and get them to develop that relationship with the dogs and cats. Because typically mom is the one who's usually always doing those things. <laughs> so enrichment, rotating enrichment is just really important. And I think we're down. Okay, so just to wrap up. Um, our book, Beyond Squeaky Toys, does have over 100, 108 actual um, enrichment ideas. We have a lot of photographs in there, and that was really to assist the reader to know what the enrichment item looks like and how it would look if the dog or cat was using it. So there's a lot of photographs in it. Um, there's four weeks of sample enrichment schedules, as Cynthia just discussed. There's procedures for creating a safe environment, and we have kind of a do's and don'ts. This comes a lot from our zoo backgrounds as well. When you are working with a 10,000 pound killer whale, you've got some safety concerns involved in some situations sometimes. So we want to make sure the first time you offer an enrichment device, you're looking, you know, does it meet this criteria? Is this animal going to be okay using this enrichment device while I'm away? Or maybe this is one that's better used when I'm home and I'm watching them. And so some of the, some of the items are supervised only, and some of them may not work for every pet. We, uh, the dog that we take on AM Northwest with us, he loves to eat paper, cardboard, toilet paper, anything that's got paper in it. So we tend not to use paper enrichment with Chewy. Um, and we just know that. He, he would rather have the meat and the bones and um, stuff like that. So um, we have the enrichment prescriptions for problem behaviors. So we talk about the six most common problem behaviors and how you can use enrichment to, um, and we refer back to the book on what page those en enrichment items are. We also talk a lot about gaining an understanding of what your pet's motives. Your pet isn't out there to make you mad. A lot of people say that, right? How many of you guys have heard that? My dog's just trying to get back at me. <laughs> no, really, they're not. <laughs> so just understanding what the motives are and why the animals do what they do, that, that's really the biggest challenge is understanding what the motivation is behind the, the behavior. And then we've heard back a lot from people. Um, Cynthia has had a lot of her daycare clients use these enrichment methods, but it's always really great to hear positive feedback. Oh, this was, you can make these enrichment items and give them 10 minutes later and really see pretty quick results with your pet. And some pets are really nervous at first. They don't understand how to use enrichment because they've never been challenged like that in their life before. And people want to give up very easily, but we tell people stick with it, just make it a little easier, try something different. And once they build confidence and they get some practice, it's kind of like training. When mm -hmm. you start off training, your animals aren't great at it either, but mm -hmm. as they get more practice under their belt, they become expert trainers and they learn faster almost, it seems. So that's kind of the same thing with enrichment. At Dog on Fun, we do a lot of enrichment with the dogs and we do a lot of feeding enrichment during lunchtime instead of just feeding them in the bowls. And we've had a couple of dogs that can't figure out the kibble in the bottle or the Kong wobbler. You know, they'll just sit there and look at you like, <laughs> I don't get it. So giving them a little hint, you know, sometimes I'll just bat it and maybe a kibble com will come out. And then when they do kind of hit it, reinforce them, that's good, good job. So it is really, it, there are some dogs that just don't get it. They can't, they haven't seen it before. So, but once they figure it out, oh my gosh. They're really into and, it. and we've heard back from clients as well, too, that um, I have one friend in particular that started giving her little dog um, kibble in an egg carton, and she had to learn how to flip the lid up, and then she'd get the kibble out of the egg carton. And then every once in a while, they'd put the food in the bowl, and their dog would look at them like, that's not how I'm eating it. <laughs> and they, she would not eat until she, they put it in the egg carton. So, and I've experienced that a lot with the exotics mm -hmm. I work with. If given a choice to hand feed mm -hmm. or do an enrichment device, most of the time, the animals turn towards the puzzle or the enrichment device, which I think is just um, 
convincing in itself with the research that research shows that animals would rather work for their food. And so something as simple as taking their kibble and throwing it out in the backyard in the grass oh, yeah. is really, really stimulating for them because they have to actually mm -hmm. smell for the food items and they're foraging for it. So. I do with my cats. I'll take a handful of kibble and throw it on the kitchen floor so that they have to go around and get it or on the carpet. I do that all the time. So that's all we have. Um. <laughs> Thank you.